methods. Work on the methods. Really, 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 really look at the methods. If you have to say, um, I used another person's protocol. It's not great. I really don't think that's the best way to, to do this. And saying, in brief, I used a protocol that we've used before, and then you go back to that paper and you say, oh, in brief, I used the same protocol that I used before. And then you keep doing this daisy chain. Oh, in this paper, I used that protocol. In this paper, I used that protocol. Look at my paper from three years ago. It's terrible. It's absolutely a terrible practice. It's one of the worst things because in that paper from 15 years ago, you're using a completely different method. You're using different sets of, um, of reagents. So one of the easiest things you can do is you can think of it as a recipe, right? When your grandmother is trying to reproduce somebody else's recipe, the first thing she's gonna look at is, hey, what do I have to go out and buy, right? So here's the list of ingredients. How nice that some journals now ask you for a list of ingredients in a table. But even if they don't ask you for a list of ingredients in a table, that's a really easy thing to do. I got this kind of flour from this store, and here's the catalog number. How nice is that, right? Here's the RID for that particular you know, flour. Does it make sense that a scientific recipe is, um, you know, basically, are you using any flour or are you using the, the whole wheat flour? Would that make a difference to your recipe? Would that make it more or less reproducible? Yeah, I think you need to know exactly which flour you used to actually reproduce this recipe. So that's the first thing. So you need to look up that list of ingredients. So that's a really easy method of, of getting this correct. And then the second part is, what exactly did you do? The exact protocol. In step one, I did this. In step two, I did this. When you look at a good recipe site, they will even have pictures. Oh, first, here's a mixing bowl. This is how we did this step. There's a journal called Jove, which is the Journal of Visualized Experiments, and they do almost exactly that. They follow you around with the camera, and then they say, oh, how did you do this part? How did you do your PCR exactly? How did you do, spin this down? And you can kind of think of this. This method section should be a really critical section. It should not be a throwaway section. It should not be a section that, you know, gets put onto the lowliest undergraduate student to write. You should really focus on writing a good, complete method section. Again, with a list of reagents, and then with a list of protocols. So here is what we did, then here is what we did. Have pictures. <laughs> Have lots of tables and graphs to be able to just show people how to reproduce that study. Because it will help. It will really help to bring together um, all of the information that somebody else needs. There's a recent study, uh, a recent paper um, by Lenny Friedman out of the GBSI. And the most, he looked at all of the different kinds of um, places where reproducibility is a problem. And he actually put some, uh, some money um, figures on, on those different places. And about half of the irreproducibility problems have something to do with reagents. So if we solve this problem, we'll be solving a good portion of the total reproducibility problems. Another place is a lot of statistical problems. So having a statistical reviewer um, on your journal is a wonderful thing to do. Asking your statistical colleagues, statistics colleagues, to look over the statistics is another great place um, to really help and make sure that the, that the paper is robust. Um, and then there, there are others. I mean, you know, are you using enough males and females in the particular study? Again, this is something that you should know from, um, from your field. But 
you know, maybe you're not using enough um, females in your particular study. When we've looked across um, all of the different journal articles, um, people who used mice didn't report whether they were using male or female mice most of the time. When they're using rats, they were only using male rats. When they were using humans, they pretty much, you know, divided up half and half. But imagine what that does to drug trials. So now you're basing a clinical trial that's supposed to be for males and females on rat studies that are only talking about and only using males. Is it going to be applicable to half your population? And it turns out many clinical trials fail, right? So why are they failing? Well, let's take a look at our, our animal subjects. Maybe they're not good enough. Maybe we're not using enough females. Maybe we're not reporting. Maybe we're not blinding. It's one of the easiest things to do. Set up the study ahead of time and blind your investigators. But many people are not randomizing. They're not blinding. And these are kind of very basic um, methods of making sure that a study is going to be reproducible because they will take out bias.